Um, thank you both. What a beautiful song. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this day. And we do give you thanks for your faithfulness and your love and your gentleness and your justice and your mercy. God, we give you thanks for this time and this place and space to worship. Whether we are in the room or online, God, could we feel connected to something bigger than ourselves, to each other and to you this day? God, we give you thanks for the fathers and father figures amongst us, for those who've gone before us. We'll be careful to give you the honor, glory, and praise. In Christ's name, amen. I got to see my daughter's first soccer match yesterday. She's five, if you don't know. And she is the oldest one on her team. My blood pressure is okay. I know that's what you're wondering. She played the Green Hornets, which are the Patriots of the, you know, under five soccer league in Plano, evidently. There was this one kid. There's always that one kid, right? This blonde-headed kid about this tall, zipping around the field. He scored 37 goals in a 38-minute match. I mean, even my daughter came up to me at the end of the game, just like out of breath. And, and she was, oh, God bless her. She tried her hardest. She said, Dad, I ran as fast as I could. We just couldn't stop him. I know. I said, baby, I know. I know. I was screaming internally the entire time. I'm well aware. Um, as a parent watching your kid just get trounced in a game, and you can tell from the very beginning, the opening 30 seconds, when you can tell this little blonde-headed kid is just going to annihilate your kid's team, there's a sense of hopelessness that takes hold, right? You're like, all right, I better like just um, get some duct tape for my mouth at the coaches. They had really thick plexiglass there, which was good. They couldn't hear me the entire time. Um, pray for me these next, I don't know, 12 years. <laughs> um, hopelessness can set in when you see something is not going to go well, and there's really, you feel like nothing that you can do about it. There's, there's hopelessness that can set in. Have you ever felt hopeless in your life? It's not as funny as the story I just told. True hopelessness can be a tough place to be. Maybe you've been in the marriage counselor's office and they've just asked what it could take to bring the two of you back together and your mind just goes blank. Or students, maybe it's 2 a.m. and you're realizing there is physically not enough time to finish this project that will make or break your grade and your semester. Hopelessness. Maybe it's living as a black American in the same week when Juneteenth is finally recognized as a national holiday, and yet lawmakers are helping to make sure that systemic racism can't be discussed in our classrooms, hopelessness. Maybe it's celebrating pride while also acknowledging that LGBTQ youth commit suicide at a rate one and a half to three times as often as heteronormative peers. Hopelessness. Have you ever felt true hopelessness, whether it was personal or global, in your life before? I have. I trust we all have. Whether our hopelessness is, is personal or larger than us, though, I would hope that we could have a faith that could speak into those moments, into those seasons, so that we are not left alone in our hopelessness, because that is a hopeless place to be. Yes? I would hope that our faith is real enough, is tangible enough, is transformative enough to speak into those moments, those seasons. So let's talk about that today. Let's talk about the story of Noah, the story of a flood, the story of a God who we will find in a moment, in a season of hopelessness. And I'm going to spoil the ending. The story is not so much about Noah's transformation. No, the, the character arc in this story is God's. God is going to walk through a season of hopelessness and come out the other side. And what God learns and experiences is something that we should pay attention to as the people of God. 
We are continuing in our series called Encountering the Spirit, where we have been looking at Old Testament stories in light of Pentecost Sunday several weeks ago, that moment when the Holy Spirit uh, descended upon the early Christian church and all of their lungs were filled with fire and the Christian movement was born. In the shadow of that day, we've been looking at some Old Testament stories where the Holy Spirit uh, sometimes captured by breath, sometimes captured by wind, sometimes captured by waves and water, um, that Holy Spirit encounters us, encounters people, encounters characters in a profound way. And we've been learning about those stories and considering how they can impact our lives today. And today we talk about Noah and the flood. The story that I can't figure out why in the world we decorate our children's ministries hallways with this story. It's always bothered me. Has it ever bothered you? I mean, if you read it literally, it is like literal genocide. Quick, put this in the pre-K hallway. Like, that's weird. Um, but I digress. Let's dig in. This is Genesis chapter 6, early on in your Bibles. This is the part that you probably read a few times when, every year when you were going to read your Bible in a year, right? And we all do that until about January 15th. Yeah, uh, me too. It's all good. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. It says this, The Lord God saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become upon the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time, right? This is a broad brush stroke. The Lord regretted, this is that Yahweh Lord, that yod heh vah breath of God, name for God. The Lord regretted that God had made human beings on the earth, and God's heart was deeply troubled, it says. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. A few things here. First of all, what must it have been like to be a flamingo or a lizard in this moment, right? You're just living your best life, I don't know, sunbathing on a rock as Mr. Iguana, and all of a sudden God is just going to smite the whole world because of these like fleshy things that are ruining everything, and you're like, what gives? I'm just here eating bugs. Why do I have to go down with the ship, right? Not really fair, is it? I think about these things sometimes. I make that joke because if we read the story of Noah too literally, we're going to be in for a bad time, right? Uh, when you take the Bible too literally, it paints a really odd, um, distasteful, um, downright harmful image of God at times. Now, the Jewish tradition was rife with, with parable and with metaphor. Think about the way that Jesus taught in his day. When Jesus was teaching about the prodigal son, it's not because he just met a guy named Jerry and wanted to tell his story, right? He's telling a story that is couched in metaphor and symbolism, and through it we develop this deep, profound understanding of who we are and who God is and who we are together. I think a similar thing is happening here with Noah. And so if we do look deeper and try to understand what the story is saying about who God is and who we are and who we are together, the first thing I notice is God's emotions in this story. You know, sometimes that folk uh, that folksy faith that we remember from our childhood, when we go back and look, it's, it's actually not found in the text. And sometimes we hear and read the story, and, and, and God is so angered by what has taken place on the earth. And God flooded the earth out of rage and anger, but that's actually not what we read just now. No, the, 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 the emotion that God is feeling is one of overwhelming sadness, profound Sadness. We could even say the, the word that is translated to say God's heart was deeply troubled. Another word for that is grieved. God was grieved as God looked upon the earth. I think that's an important point for us to notice, an important aspect and character of God for us to identify with, because in my experience and in my learning and in my reading, I, I have found this to be true, that hopelessness so very often grows from untouched grief. I believe one reason that God um, acts out of this hopelessness, that the, the world is just beyond repair, that there's no coming back from this, the only answer is to flood this earth, is because there is this grief that we did not turn out the way that God would have hoped. There's this grieving that God is experiencing. In my life, when there is untouched grief, grief that I have not dealt with, stepped into, hopelessness can grow out of that untouched grief. Has that been true for you? 
I had a woman in my office this past week who had asked to speak with me, and we sat in, in, in the office, and, and she had been experiencing hopelessness recently because she lost some close friends of hers. And in our hour together, she, she cried, and, and I started to well up with tears, and, and even just her naming the, the phrase, I miss her, and saying her name out loud, the friend that she had lost, she said, you know, I don't feel as hopeless as when I entered this room. And I said, well, sometimes our tears do the talking for us. The irony is that we, we, we sometimes treat hope and grief as opposites. And there's a lot of smiley televangelists that will step on stage and say, if you just believe in Jesus, you can have hope and no more sadness, right? What a load of crock. What a load of crock. What I've found proven to be true, not just in my life, but in the lives of people I've known and loved, is that the more we step into our grief, the more we bravely embrace those grief-stricken places in our hearts and in our lives, the more that hope becomes a real tangible gift in our lives as well. We are met by, by hope as a gift in that path of grief, not as a separate path entirely. It's time that we name and acknowledge that. As a people, we don't know how to grieve that well, and as a people, we tend to find ourselves hopeless as well. Do we think there might be a connection there? Hope is not the alternative path to grief, but rather hope is the gift we receive in the midst of our grief. Then the next verse in this chapter says this, in verse 8 it says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Now that is a blink and you'll miss it kind of phrase that would have meant everything to the Israelites living in those days. I'll tell you why. You may have heard this before, but, but the Noah story is not the only flood myth that exists in other cultures, especially the cultures around the same time as the Israelites were living. There are cultures throughout the world that have stories of a great flood, but specifically their region, there were all these flood stories that came up around the same time as a way of wrestling with and trying to understand this natural disaster. Now, the, we can even see some elements in Noah's story that were practically lifted straight from the Epic of Gilgamesh, a story coming out of the Babylonian people around the same time. And it can be easy to see how harsh God's response is the hopelessness of wiping out nearly every living thing on the planet. But don't blink and miss verse 8. The hope that we can see in the story comes from the uniqueness of this Noah flood story in relation to the other versions in its same day and age. Because here's the deal. Almost everybody's God causes the flood. Right? I mean, what kind of God do you have, honestly, if God's not in charge of the flood? That's a pretty weak-willed God in those days. So, of course, God causes the flood in their context. But it's the fact that that same God, Yahweh God, the breath of life God, the cosmic creator God, all-powerful, takes time to notice and to see just one man, just one family in the midst of the entire broken world. That is something we can't miss. It's something they certainly would not have missed in their day. See, in other versions of the story, maybe someone was saved, but it was always some sidekick character that would trick the God into saving them, or they gave him a heads up, hey, this flood's coming, you better do something. But here, it is God, God's self, yod heh vad -Hey, breath of God, doing the saving. This wasn't a God that needed to be tricked into saving life. This is a God who seeks out to save and sustain the life that they called perfect and good since the beginning of time. I'm going to get another mic, I think, because it sounds like the one I'm using is busted. One of these. Oh, we good? I just want to make sure that we're not losing our friends online. Sorry, sorry, folks. We good? Okay, I'm going to keep going. So, um, the point in noticing verse 8, the point in noticing God's noticing of Noah is this, that God tells a surprising, more gracious story. The, the lesson that we learn even in the sixth chapter of Genesis is that this God is unlike other gods that maybe they had heard of before. This is unlike the God of the Babylonians. This is unlike the kind of gods that sure have power over the waters, but this God has the power to see the individual, to see and notice what is happening upon this earth in a more gracious and more surprising way. 
Part of living as a people of hope, a people who seek to follow in the footsteps of this God, is to witness a world where violence and corruption may be widespread, but we remain steadfastly committed to writing surprising and more gracious stories led by the Holy Spirit. One of the saints we can turn our eyes to to see what it means to write a surprising and more gracious story is St. Opal Lee. Maybe you've heard her story this week. Opal Lee is the reason why we celebrated as a country Juneteenth as a national holiday for the very first time yesterday. Opal was born in Marshall, Texas, a town I've driven past a million times on I-20 on the way to Mississippi. Her family moved into a predominantly white neighborhood in Fort Worth when she was 12 years old. And one week after they moved into their home, a mob of 500 white residents vandalized and burned down their house. No arrests would be made. That experience was a crucible experience that forged in her heart the heart of an activist and the heart of a justice seeker that would one day lead her at the age of 89 in the year 2016, at the age of 89, to walk from Fort Worth all the way to Washington, D.C. She walked two and a half miles every single day, symbolizing the two and a half years that uh, elapsed between the Emancipation Proclamation and the day when Union soldiers finally proclaimed liberation to the black slaves living in Galveston this day, June 19th of 1865, this day that we have come to know as Juneteenth. Every day she walked two and a half miles to make her way to D.C., And it's because of her work, her advocacy, her unwillingness to allow hatred to win, her desire to let her people's pain and hopes be heard by all of us and to bless all of us as a nation together. St. Opal knows what it means to see a world entrenched in violence and corruption. She knows it better than most. But she also knows what it means to hold fast to hope, no matter how slight the sliver may be, and to work towards a surprising, more gracious story. We can fix our eyes on St. Opal Lee this week. Amen? So the story continues. This is the last bit we're going to read today. In verse 14, it says, God is speaking to Noah and says, So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, and make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. And God says, This is how you are supposed to build it. The ark is 300 cubits long, and 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Now notice the way that God describes this ark. It's 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. It's not so much an ark as it is a box, almost like the size of a shoe box, just way bigger, right? And, and God's going to tell Noah what to put inside this box. God says, put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on the earth will perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wives and your sons' wives with you. But then God goes on. There's a second version of this story because the Bible has two authors at times simultaneously. And the Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. What God is commanding Noah to do is essentially this, build your own little box, big box, but your own little box compared to God, and and put within it your own Garden of Eden. We we are only a few chapters separated from this simple perfection that God had, had hoped to bring life into the world and had somehow become corrupted. And so God is now saying, Noah, why don't we create this together? Build your own box and place within that box uh, your very own Garden of Eden. And take the not just the perfect parts, by the way, not just the clean animals. Take the unclean animals as well. Take all the stuff that doesn't seem to fit. Take all of it and piece of every bit of creation, and I will help you to keep it. It's safe. And then at the end, on the other side, we'll plant it together and we'll see what grows from there. 
This story is so important to come so early in our holy scriptures because it establishes this theology of redemption that is so foundational to the Christian faith. It's a big reason why I follow after Jesus, this concept of redemption. And a theology of redemption, it's well and alive here in the story of Noah. It means a few things. First is that God does not desire the evil and injustice in this world. You'll hear me say frequently that God will lead us, God does not lead us to tragedy, but God leads us through tragedy. Right? It's important to understand that God does not desire evil and injustice in, the, in this world. And at the same time, God does not abandon us, no matter how hopeless we may feel. What's fascinating in the story of Noah is that at the other end of the story, God looks down at people and realizes that we're still kind of just as messed up as we were before. It's not that people have changed, but in the story of Noah, gasp, it appears as though God does. And God says, knowing what I know and grieving that this has not turned out the way that maybe I would have wished, I will no longer abandon. I'm not going to give in to hopelessness. I'm instead going to push through my grief and step into hope, and I will put a sign in the skies, a mark of a rainbow, to let people know that I will never, never, never abandon them. And lastly, redemption means this, that God can take even the greatest trauma or tragedy that our world or that we have to offer and can help us to discover healing and hope in this life like a wild, imperfect, beautiful garden springing forth after a flood. This week, can we hold in our hands a box not unlike Noah's and place within it little pieces of creation, the beautiful bits, the perfect bits, but the messy bits and the imperfect bits as well. But friends, just like Noah, let's not keep it in the box, but Let's open it up. I hear God calling us all in the story of Noah to unbox Eden in our own ways, in our own places, to plant those seeds of redemption in hopeless people and hopeless places, including ourselves. Because while hopelessness is surely a reality in this life, God says there is more to life than this. Unbox Eden alongside with God. Allow God to call you to be a gardener, whether or not you can actually keep anything alive. I have killed aloe vera plants, my friends. It's a metaphor. Go with me. Allow the Spirit to lead us to be gardeners in the world around us, to plant those seeds of redemption, those little slivers of hope, so that others and ourselves might be invited into this grace of God that we so desperately search for. May the spirit of, and guidance of St. Opal Lee remind us that sometimes grace is patient and stubborn and sees the possibility in the face of hatred and violence. Sometimes grace makes its own way and refuses to take no for an answer. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, my friends. May the spirit lead us to be gardeners together, to unbox Eden and plant seeds of redemption in our world. Amen.